Thank you everyone for coming out. It's a special day indeed. Um, I was telling everyone that last week we had a got to have a wedding and a great service here on Sunday, and this week do a, get to see a baptism. And um, and again, baptism Sunday. I, it's like, I like it to think of it as Gospel Sunday. You will know the gospel before you leave today for sure. Um, and next Sunday, I want to put a special plug in. We have a special guest speaker, and I'm, he, I don't know how to feel me telling you, but it's Jason Moat, um, and he's going to preach his first sermon next Sunday. Um, in the Bible, it says the difference between deacons and elders is one is elders should be able to teach, and we're studying biblical eldership together as elders, and um, something that Jason came to me right away, and he wanted, an oper- he wanted to learn to preach, and um, next um, Friday and Saturday, Hope and I are going to two days are full, are full of classes for adoption because we're in the adoption process. So I thought, well, this would be a good Sunday for him to, to preach. And I'll, we'll be here, and it'll be fun. So I just encourage you, please come out and support our beloved Jason. And um, and interestingly enough, I sent him a text because, as you know, he's fighting a fire right now. <laughs> and um, thank, thank the Lord for the firefighters. And I said, hey, I know that you're out there for two weeks. There'll be a lot to ask you to preach. And he texted me back and said, oh, no, I'm preaching. He says, so... Yeah, it's going to be great. I maybe have some good sermon illustrations for us. Um, so this morning, we are going to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Thanks, Chris. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Maybe you can stay back there and catch them as they go. <laughs> and um, so if you turn your Bibles to that chapter or your digital device, and I will open us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the um, privilege, Lord, of worshiping you, Lord, of being your children, of being your, your people, Lord, and, and to be called by your name, Father. And as we um, just look into the meaning of baptism, look into the gospel, this, uh, the meaning of God, the gospel this day, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through it, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would, um, your Holy Spirit would come and illumine our hearts and apply the eternal word of truth to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard a story of a certain family. They were driving home from church one Sunday afternoon, and they were happily talking about a friend who was presented as a candidate for baptism on that particular day. And they were saying how proud of them, and just as they, they were all saying how proud they were of him. And that when three-year-old uh, daughter Elizabeth chimed up and said, Daddy, what does it mean to be baptized? And before Daddy could even get a word out to answer Elizabeth, five-year-old Joshua spoke up. He said, oh, baptism, that's when the preacher washes all of your senses away. There's so many questions surrounding the Christian term baptism. It seems as if every every church has a different method or idea of what baptism means and how exactly the steps should be taken. But what is baptism? Well, to answer that question, we're going to look at the first seven verses of Romans chapter 6, look at the idea as the, as the Apostle Paul presents it. Now, as a disclaimer, don't get caught up in the, in the difficulties of these first seven verses. Just the big picture. See if you can capture the biggest concept that Paul has here. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into a death in, in, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that it, our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. What is baptism? These verses show us three things about baptism. First, baptism reminds us that we need a Savior. Baptism reminds us that we need a Savior, that we can't save ourselves. For those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Paul is talking about something that happened to us in a very private inner inner moment of our life. For me, it happened when I was very young. 
Well, baptism is an external expression of this internal reality that has taken place. The Bible teaches us, especially in Romans, the first three chapters of Romans, that all of us were not, not only born into sin, but we were actually conceived in sin. You know, when I was conceived in the womb of my mother, a number of things were transferred over to me. I got my father's face, sorry. And I got my mother's diabetes. But one thing was passed on to them that, that is true, and it was passed on to me, and it's true of, of everyone within the sound of my voice, is that a sin nature, a, a contaminated nature was passed on as well. I didn't ask for it, but I received it. And the Bible says because this nature exists within all of us, none of us can enter into God's presence. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 says. You see, God's the holy God. That's his address. That's where he lives. That's where he's at. And we cannot, we cannot be in the presence of God without that evil being atoned for or being made right. But the problem is, is I cannot, and you cannot rid yourself of this sinful nature by yourself. So what happens to us is we must live our lives separated from God. And if you think the societies are living their life separated from God, go home and watch the news when, you, when, this, when the service is over. People are lost and living their lives separated from God. It's much like the, the picture that we have in the, in the temple in ancient Israel, the Holy of Holies. We can't break through the veil. So the Bible says on the day that we come to the point of death, if we have not been able to make right the sinful nature of this, if we have not been able to rid ourselves 100% of it, then we will die. And I'm not talking only about just a physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. Eternal death. Ezekiel says, The soul that sinneth shall surely die. Our lives will be offered up as wages, or as the price for our sin. Romans, Romans says, The wages of sin is death. So there we will. We will live. We'll continue for all of eternity to live separated from God. But the beginning of Christian conversion takes place when an individual recognizes and admits that they have the sinful nature within them that's keeping them separate from God, both now and for all of eternity. And trust me, when someone comes to truly recognize, when you truly grasp that you're living right now and forever separated from God, I can assure you it takes a little bit of the joy out of life today, doesn't it? It's really hard to enjoy life when you come to that realization. Imagine yourself standing before a judge and a jury. And the judge brings his gavel down and he says, You're guilty and you are, you are, you are hereby sentenced to death. So you enter into a cell you, you, and there you stay for three months until they bring you out, lay you on a table and inject the stuff into your veins and you will die. You might say to me, Well, Pastor, I'll enjoy those three months. I'm going to really live it up for those three months. Really. I think it would be very difficult to, to enjoy life on death row, don't you? Well, the same reality is true of every one of us when we come to terms with the reality that we have been sentenced not only to death, but to eternal death, the separation from God. Maybe you have a year left. Maybe you have 20 years left. Maybe you have 50 years left. I remember when I used to think that life that was so, so long and I had forever left. But as it turns out, it, it, it doesn't go, go that slow after all. For most of the time that you have left, you live with the reality that you are simply sitting in a cell on death row. But here's the good news. And this is good news, by the way. Hang with me, please. <laughs> God recognized this problem. So what did he do? He sent his own son. He sent his son to, to die for sin. His son did, who didn't know sin. So not only is he God, but he took, took on the likeness of man. And he is fully man. And he lived his life for 30 years. And then we, that is the whole human race, put him, put him on the cross and put him to death. For something that he didn't do. And when he offered up his life, the Bible says, God chose to take all of our sins, all of the sins of the world, past, present, and future, and he laid them on Jesus at his death. And there he, he crucified and died. He was dead for, for three days. But because he was perfect, because he didn't know any sin, death couldn't hold him. He conquered death, and he rose again after three days. Now listen, if you ever want to know what mercy is, this is mercy. This is mercy at the highest level. 
I mean, basically what God says is this. Look, you're in trouble, and you can't fix your problem. So I'm going to make a deal with you. If you, come to, if you come to terms with the fact that you're in trouble, if you come to terms with the fact that you're sitting on death row, I will allow you to claim my son's death for yourself. So that when you die, I will attribute my son's righteousness, the, right, the righteousness of his death to you, so that your sins, although they're still a part of you, I no longer see. And they've been, been, they been made right before me, not by the works which you have done, but by the works my son has done for you. But here's the caveat, you must receive it. You must receive it so that when you die, you will spend eternity with me. And not only will you spend eternity, eternity with me when you die, but the moment you accept me, you are no longer separated from me. From that moment on, you will have eternal life, which is a kind of life. And you will have uninhibited access to me from that day on forever. See, what Jesus is saying to us when, when he died on the cross is that we were crucified with him. It was as though you were stuck up on the cross, even though you didn't have to experience the pain of it. And we were dead in Christ because our lives were going absolutely nowhere without him. And what enables a person to come to saving faith in God and Jesus Christ is acknowledgement of that. And one day standing before, before the Lord saying, Look, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I'm claiming the death of Jesus from, uh, for myself. I believe that he's the Son of God. I believe that he rose from the dead. I can't do this on my own. I want you to be the Lord of my life. And it's that simple. The work of God is to believe in the one whom he sent. In that very moment, in the, in the very private moment of your life, you're washed clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. And we forever have a relationship with God, both now and for all of eternity. Baptism reminds us that we need a Savior. It reminds us we can't save ourselves. And second, baptism reminds us of what Christ has done. It reminds us what Christ has done. Death, burial, and resurrection. Look again at verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism is an outward expression of of this inward reality that's taking place. It's an object lesson of the gospel. When, when Elise is baptized this morning, she could have demonstrated for you what happened to her in that very private moment of her life when she accepted Jesus as her Lord. Now, baptism doesn't save us. Jesus' blood saves us. Baptism is, is the act whereby a believer in Jesus Christ chooses to stand before the world and give an outward picture of what happens to them in, when they trust in Jesus Christ. It could have taken place 10 years ago. Or it might happen this, this very day. But the image we have as we stand in the water and that, and that person puts you under the water is that it represents being buried with Christ in the likeness of his death. And when you were brought up out of the water, it symbolizes being brought up out of the water and being raised with Christ to new life. Death, burial, and resurrection. The word baptism in Romans chapter 6 is the Greek word baptism, which literally means to drown. And the imagery we have, when in obedience what Jesus Christ has asked us, asked us to do, when we, is we immerse a person completely underwater because we understand that to be the meaning of the word. So here at Whispering Pines, we don't believe in adult baptism. We believe in believer's baptism. That is, uh, baptism is something we do after we have accepted Jesus Christ because everyone in the scriptures were baptized after they believed. Now, it's interesting. In, 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 in the in New Testament times, no one would have ever dreamed that you had to be baptized to be saved, but they would have never dreamed not to be baptized either. Baptism is an act of being immersed in water to publicly identify a decision that, someone, that one has made regarding Jesus Christ. It reminds us of what Christ has done. And the question is, why is it so important? Why is it so important? Our culture we're living in it seems to be actually giving proof of why it's important more than I could ever say. And we are becoming more and more polarized as Christians in the culture that we live in. See, baptism reminds others of what Christ has done. 
Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Baptism is a public announcement that we are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. It's a public declaration that we are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Let me take you back to the first century in the days of the first disciples in the city of Jerusalem. Most of the people living in the city were devout Orthodox Jews who, who were practicing the law as, they, as it appeared in the Old Testament. And whenever a man or woman, child or teenager, be, became a Christian, let me tell you, it was a very extreme thing. If you want to be known, you have to become a follower of Jesus Christ, or a follower of the way as it was known, or, or, the, or a follower of the name, it was very likely that your family or business associates, or both, would cut you off. And so what was happening in the first century is a lot of people were taking on themselves the freedom and mercy of Jesus Christ, but they were keeping it to themselves. Why? They didn't want to lose out of the community. But Jesus says, look, I don't want you to be ashamed of me. I did all of this for you. Is it too much for me to ask you to stand up and do this for me? To stand with me as I stood for you? So, Christians were going out to the Jordan in this wide open place. And there they would be joined not only by the cell church, but they were also joined by people in the community, businessmen and women, family members and relatives, people who stood on the banks and said, look, if that person goes through this, I'll never ever do business with them again. And the person being baptized knew that. And then another person would come in to be baptized. And their family, their family would be standing on the shore saying, if Elise goes through with this, she identifies herself with Jesus Christ, we're going to cut her off. She will receive no inheritance. We will speak to her again. She will be shunned. I once heard a story of a pastor who said when he was in college, he served as a summer missionary in East Malaysia. While he was there, he attended a small church. And during this particular church service, a young teenage girl came to be baptized and then announced her decision to follow Jesus Christ. Well, during the service, he noticed a, an old, rugged lug sitting, sitting leaning over against the wall of the sanctuary. He asked the pastor about it. And the pastor said, oh, that's, that, that luggage belongs to the girl who has, who has just been baptized. Her father, took, her father said that if she was baptized as a Christian, and if she was, became a follower of Jesus Christ, don't ever bother to come back in this house ever again. So she brought her luggage with her. You see the price that people have, have to pay. Jesus said, I want you to do this for me. Well, let me give you another uh, analogy. I've used this before. Imagine that now I've been married to Hope over 11 years now. I don't, I don't pretend to love her perfectly or even half perfectly. But in my frailty, Hope knows that I love her. Let's just say we're at Mile High Stadium next January, watching the Denver Broncos lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers in the AFC Championship game. And it's exactly one week after all these social distancing have been, lift, have been lifted and we're all celebrating, life is back to normal. <laughs> And the place is packed. Well, I decided I want the whole world to know that I love my wife. So I sneak down. I grab the microphone that that lady just used to sing the national anthem. And then without permission, I pick up and say, Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. I just want you to know that I love my wife, Hope Crinky. Okay? Thank you very much. And then I, I go sit down next to Hope. And she looks at me. She's saying, You made a fool of yourself. Right? You didn't have to do that. I know that you love me. And I say, look, Hope, I know that you know. But it's very important for me that, that the whole world know. And I, and I may have thought of myself, yes, but I think the whole world knows now. I think it'll make all the headlines on the, on the, on the, on the news tonight. Well, that's what baptism is. Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And when a person that he's given his life for chooses to stand up and publicly identify with, with Jesus Christ, and hold out a microphone and say, Hello, my name is, is Elise McMullen. I want everyone to know that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed of it. Do to me what you may, but I'm not turning back. When a person does that, they, the Bible says there's no tears in heaven, but I imagine that Jesus looks, looks down and smiles and turns to his Father 
He says, look, she's not ashamed of me. When someone stands up and publicly says that they love you, unashamedly, it's an awesome thing. It's an incredible thing. And that's what baptism is. Jesus calls us to publicly identify with him, just like the first century Christians did, and say, look, do to me what you may, but I, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and I unashamedly stand for Christ. And we are going to give, have an opportunity in our culture to do that outside of the baptism ceremony, I, I, will, I will tell you. And it's coming. Baptism reminds us we need a Savior. It reminds us we can't save ourselves. Baptism reminds us what Jesus Christ has done. It's an outward picture of what happened to us internally. And baptism reminds others of what Jesus has done. Baptism announces that we are unashamed to be identified with Jesus Christ. Baptism is a public reminder of our need for Christ and our public declaration of what he has done for us. It's a public reminder of our need for Jesus Christ and a public declaration of what he has done for us. In baptism, as one author said, and I'll say these words to close, we are initiated, crowned, chosen, embraced, washed, adopted, gifted, reborn, killed, and thereby sent forth and redeemed. We are identified as one of God's own and then assigned to our place and our job within the kingdom of God. So let's pray. And we're going to pray. And we have a special song uh, for us. Um, by um, um, Hope will we'll introduce the special song that we have. And then we're going to have a baptism ceremony. If you've never been baptized, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, now's the time. It, it will make all of our weekends. What greater way to celebrate up the weekend than to um, celebrate a new birth in Jesus Christ and a baptism. So as we pray, let's prepare our hearts to transition to those things. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of the gospel. Lord, we celebrate the gospel, Lord. And, and Lord, we thank you for the, the picture we have of the gospel in, the, in, the, uh, in this ordinance of the sacrament or ordinance of baptism. Lord, we, we pray, Lord, that I pray everyone here will be impacted with the truth uh, of um, the gospel today. Lord, I pray that we all surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, Lord. If, we've done, if people haven't done that, Lord, I pray that this week today, the way they come to you and say, I can't live my life on my own. I, 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 I accept you as Lord and Savior in my life. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he rose, he rose again from the dead and for the forgiveness of my sins, Lord. And, and I pray, Lord God, that um, we, we would just uh, rejoice together. In Jesus' name, amen.